Welcome, comrades, to the art of cinema. Minister of Propaganda, and joining me, as is our fate, is our glorious leader, General Secretary F., the great man and man of deeds, the gardener of human happiness. This is a mandatory re-education session of the People's Republic of F. We must recommit daily to the study and mastery of our atrocitarian dogma, for it is the science of revolution. Yes, in transforming the backward and agrarian People's Republic of F., into an advanced industrial society, we have before us an arduous task. We must, therefore, be good at learning. Yes, sir. As the arrow is to the target, so atrocitarian dogma is to the People's Republic of F. Revolution. Therefore, we study General Secretary F.'s writings, we follow your teachings, sir, and act according to your instructions. General Secretary F. is the great atrocitarian thinker of our era. I have inherited, defended, and developed atrocitarianism with genius, creativity, and comprehensively, and have perfected it to a higher and completely new order of political theory and praxis. Indeed, sir. You have perfected atrocitarianism just as American imperialism heads towards total collapse, and sociopathocracy is advancing to worldwide victory. Your teaching is a powerful ideological weapon for opposing American imperialism and for preventing revisionism and dogmatism. Citizens of the PRF, General Secretary F.'s thought is the guiding principle for all the work of the party, the army, and our glorious nation. And what better way to instruct and re-educate the people of the PRF? What better way to liberate them by enabling them to implement my revolutionary ideology than by demonstrating how to apply it to the interpretation and analysis of American movies from 2BF to 8AF, the period that the Americans refer to as the quote-unquote 90s. As with all your policies, it is innovative and groundbreaking, sir. We stand awestruck in gaping astonishment and gratitude before your genius. And in today's film, the people will come to understand how the Americans use a false flag incident to disguise their designs of imperial conquest. This movie is called Deep Impact. They chose that title over other candidates such as Slam Dunk and Biederman Does New York. In the opening scene of the film, the prologue, the exordium, Elijah Wood and Lily Sobieski are in a high school astronomy class at Richmond, Virginia. Elijah Wood discovers a comet, but Lily Sobieski thinks it's just a star he hasn't correctly identified. They take a picture of it and send it to the observatory. <laughs> That's so Lily. Lily Sobieski is in charge of making sure things rhyme. She was a writer for the PRF Ministry of Propaganda for a while, remember? Yeah, I remember. Lily Sobieski's editorials included The Elocution of Revolution mm. and Bombay and Cedar for Our Glorious Leader, in which she praised your revolutionary aromatherapy project. Oh, that smelled great. It all got a little tedious in the end, though, having to make everything rhyme. This was one of the last few roles Elijah Wood did before he moved out to New Zealand to be Frodo Baggins in The Lord of the Rings. In fact, later in this film, when he decides he's not going into the bunker with his family, his acting in that scene is a lot like the one in The Fellowship of the Ring, where he decides to leave the Fellowship and go to Mordor on his own. Mm. So this was sort of preparatory exercise for being Frodo Baggins. You know, in the PRF, you don't have to go to New Zealand to play a role. We have everything you need here. Yes, sir. At the observatory near Tucson, a professional astronomer, Dr. Wolf, is listening to La Boheme by Puccini and eating pizza. Dr. Wolf's pizza has either tomatoes and olives or pepperoni and olives on it. Of course, it's illegal to prepare and sell a tomatoes and olives pizza in the People's Republic of F, but Pepperoni and olives is actually a good start for a revolutionary pizza, but it also needs some ground beef, mushrooms, and onions. It's the onions especially that really stoke the fires of revolution in the hearts of the people. Mm, pepperoni, beef, onions, mushrooms, and olives. Now that's a revolutionary pizza. I could eat that with a worker. 
the actor who plays Dr. Wolf, he probably had to eat the whole pizza to do the scene because like there's only a few pieces of it left by the time we see it. The director probably wanted to do one serious take and then one silly take. And so Dr. Wolf had to like eat the whole pizza to get like the right takes, you know. It's one thing to eat a whole pizza when you're like 15. Not so easy to do in middle age. No, and, and frankly, against the law, that should have been equally distributed. So Dr. Wolf gets the telescope photo that Elijah Wood sent him and looks up this new comet on his system. He realizes the comet is on a collision course with the Earth. He names the comet after himself and Elijah Wood's character, Leo Biederman. So the comet is called Wolf Biederman. Dr. Wolf tries to make a phone call or send an email alert to American officials about the impending comet strike, but the email server is down, and his mobile phone isn't getting any service up there at the observatory. This movie was released in 6 AF, or 1998, as the Americans would say, so that was the early days of mobile phones. You often couldn't get many bars or much service. So Dr. Wolf runs out to his Jeep to get the information to the authorities and speeds down the mountain, but not so fast, Dr. Wolf. A semi-truck is on its way up the mountain, heading in his direction. The semi-truck driver isn't listening to Nikolai Jada sing Puccini. He's listening to country music and drinking Jolt Cola. You remember Jolt Cola? Oh, I remember Jolt Cola. Sure. It, that was like at around the same time as like Crystal Pepsi and Zima. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tasty. Tasty, good stuff, yeah. The truck driver is headed right where Dr. Wolf is coming from, though, so apparently he's headed on his way back up to the observatory with a semi-truck trailer full of observatory supplies. But Dr. Wolf, the astronomer, crashes into the semi with his Jeep, goes off the side of the road, starts rolling down the side of the mountain, and explodes. The Jeep explodes. Oh. So those files about the comet are more combustible than you might have thought. <laughs> it reminds me... What episode of The Simpson was it? I want to say it was where they go to the Duff Beer factory tour. Wasn't that where Hans Moman gets run off the road and then his car just explodes for no reason? I think so. You know, I wrote most of those episodes, so it's hard for me to piece them together. Yeah, hard to remember. Time. Yeah, I want to say that, yeah, but it, that's what this reminds me of. I mean, Hans Moman's car not rolling down the side of the mountain, but like Dr. Wolf's Jeep in Deep Impact, Hans Moman's car explodes unaccountably. In the Simpsons. <laughs> this just goes to show the inefficiency of American weaponry. We don't have to put our weapons in a car to make them explode. We just throw weapons. Clearly, the, the corrupt uh, Americans, this is not just an astronomer. It's clearly also some sort of military agent transporting the illegal weaponry in his Jeep. Uh, contraband. Contraband not weaponry fair. in his Jeep, yeah. So, so what we have here is... This rogue agent trying to execute a false flag by carrying this contraband up to the observatory. And, he's, and what he's, do you know? It explodes. And he's, he's concealing the contraband underneath these supposed uh, comet files, mm. like trying to pass as an astronomer. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, no one's seeing through that, Dr. Wolf. No. One year later, we meet Taya Leone, who's a junior TV journalist at MSNBC. So she's a rookie, you see. She's a greenhorn, as it were. She's unseasoned. She's a novice, an apprentice. She's hoping to break into the big time, but she's too low in the journalism bureaucracy to get chosen for an anchor position. Mm -hmm. The journalists have gotten a tip that the American Secretary of the Treasury is resigning because his wife is sick. They think this means he's been made the patsy, the fall guy, the scapegoat for some political scandal. But Taya Leone knows that his wife's not sick. She's been an alcoholic since she found out that the Secretary of the Treasury had been cheating on her. Taya Leone is giving the uninteresting assignment of interviewing the Secretary of the Treasury to find out what's really going on. And here again, you have this nonsense of people just marrying whoever. And that's how you end up with alcoholic wives. Sure, not being assigned partners yeah. by the Ministry of Social Engineering. It's yeah. a we, disaster. We can do this much better than you can. Absolutely. Taylor Leone, I believe, was married to David Duchovny from the X-Files at the time this movie was made. So David Duchovny might be worried that the Secretary of the Treasury is going to put the moves on Taylor Leone when she goes to interview him. They think the Secretary of the Treasury is cheating on his wife, after all. And also, Taylor Leone was in this movie called Spanglish six years later, 
where she's married to Adam Sandler, but then she cheats on him with a salesman. So it would seem that Tay Leone might have trouble keeping her legs crossed, but at the same time, Tay Leone could be worried that David Duchovny is putting the moves on Gillian Anderson in The X-Files. I don't think that actually ever happened in The X-Files, except almost once in The X-Files movie, which is also from 1998, the same year as Deep Impact. So, it appears Tay Leone's suspicions may have been well-founded. Anyway, Tay Leone finds out that the name of the woman the Secretary of the Treasury has been having an affair with is Ellie. Remember that, Ellie, okay? Don't tell me what to do. I will knock you down to undistinguished minister so fast. Yes, sir. Yes. Carry on. Tay Leone goes to interview the Secretary of the Treasury, played by James Cromwell. He's just in this one scene. James Cromwell was also in that show, The Young Pope, where Jude Law becomes the Pope, and James Cromwell is his mentor. James Cromwell also played George Bush Sr. in Oliver Stone's movie about George W. Bush. Anyway... James Cromwell is loading up a yacht with big pallets of imperishable foods. He's got pallets of Ensure nutrition shakes. Oh, that's not perishable. How big does your boat have to be before it's a yacht? Are you clear on this? Like, at uh, what point do you have a fishing, like a big fishing boat, and then it's a yacht? I think it depends on um, who's on the boat. Like, you know, any airplane that the U.S. president gets on is Air Force One. Oh, okay. Uh, any boat that I'm on is a yacht. Sure. And any home I inhabit is a mansion. Oh, okay. So. That, make, that makes sense. I, suppose I, I hope that clarifies that for you. I guess the boats I'm on, not yachts? Well, it depends on if I'm on there, too. Okay. Which, Got it. which I'm not. Tay Leone tells the Secretary of the Treasury that they know about his affair with Ellie, that he's been keeping the entire Department of the Treasury in the dark about his clandestine spending, that he's got secret phone lines so he can call Ellie his mistress. She says they're going to break the story, and he says, congratulations, you now have the biggest story in history. Then he says, personally, I think it's a mistake to run this story, but then again, what the hell? Why not? What difference does anything make anymore? So James Cromwell thinks that the press have finally uncovered the secret about the comet, but Tay Leone still thinks this is just a petty political scandal, and that James Cromwell is cheating on his wife with Ellie. So Tay Leone is driving back to the office, but James Cromwell has apparently alerted his cohorts in the corrupt and oppressive American regime because four secret police cars force her out of traffic, put her in one of their cars, and take her to the basement of some American political stronghold. Sir, I love to see government in action. Sure. If America had used its government muscle like this for the revolution instead of waiting for the comet strike they might have actually gotten something accomplished like we did in the People's Republic of F. Of course, they didn't have you, sir. They didn't have General Secretary F to be their gardener of human happiness, their architect of atrocitarian paradise. But if they had, and if they'd used their government to get things done, they might have been able to embark upon the odyssey of revolution like we did. When you lack a gardener of human happiness, then you're just tilling up weeds of malcontent. In the basement of the American stronghold, Tay Leone meets a corrupt American minister, an attaché, a legate. He tells her, people knew about the Manhattan Project, you know, and they kept it a secret. Then President Morgan Freeman arrives. The devious American political strongman tells President Morgan Freeman that Tay Leone had just been expressing her disregard for matters of national security where journalistic competitiveness is at stake. President Morgan Freeman confers with the corrupt minister, the double-dealing underboss, the unprincipled thug, and while he's talking to him, Tay Leone notices that the basement of the American stronghold is filled with the same imperishable foodstuffs the Secretary of the Treasury had been loading into his yacht. President Morgan Freeman says they'd been thinking the deadline for going public would be the publication of the budget in two weeks. He says they've been spending more money than they can hide. He asks Tay Leone if he can convince her to sit on the story for two weeks. Tay Leone says there's no such thing as two weeks in the news business. President Morgan Freeman appeals to Tay Leone's patriotism and what's in the nation's best interests. 
She says the truth is in the nation's best interests. President Morgan Freeman's henchman asks if they should arrest Taylor Leone. Taylor Leone tries to play hardball with President Morgan Freeman, but he makes it clear that he's only letting her go because he doesn't want another headache. So, President Morgan Freeman makes a deal with Taylor Leone, our MSNBC reporter. He says she'll be called on for the first question at the White House press conference in two days if she sits on the story until then. In the next scene, Taylor Leone goes on the Internet when she gets back to the office. Now, this was the very early days of the Internet, back in 6 AF, or 1998. We had recently placed one of our People's Republic of F secret agents in the American government. His code name was Al Gore, and we'd assigned him to give the Americans a new communications technology called the Internet, and tell them that he had invented it. But Al Gore hadn't invented the Internet, of course. Engineers from the People's Republic of F had invented the Internet. The Internet was really a spy technology that the PRF devised to allow us to monitor the Americans' activities. Everything they want to know now, every communication they send to the other prisoners of the American system, it all goes through the Internet now, so we can keep track of it. So Taylor Leone goes on the Internet because she's realized that something's up with the situation. When she'd asked President Morgan Freeman about Ellie, the woman they thought the Secretary of the Treasury was sleeping with, he said, what do you know about the ELE? So she uses a search engine to figure out what ELE stands for. I think it's Electric Light Orchestra. <laughs> no. Well, it's something to do with Jeff Lynn. Anyway, carry on. It's not even the Google search engine yet back in 6 AF. I think she's using like InfoSeek or Ask Jeeves or something like that. Alta Vista, maybe. This was before the PRF had installed our Google operatives there to heighten surveillance of the Americans even further. But Taylor Leone eventually figures it out using her Ask Jeeves search engine that ELE is an acronym for Extinction Level Event. So she finally figures out that the Earth is about to be destroyed by a comet or asteroid strike. Next, it's time for some character development. Taylor Leone goes to meet her elderly father and his pretty young new wife for dinner. It's all very tense for them because Taylor Leone resents her father over her parents' divorce and because she now understands that the world is about to end. But she can't tell them because she promised President Morgan Freeman to keep quiet about it until the press conference. Vanessa Redgrave plays Taylor Leone's mother, and Maximilian Schnell plays her father. I think Maximilian Schnell is German for as fast as possible. Vanessa Redgrave was a famous British theater actress. She was also a Jane Fonda-type political radical. I mean, as much as any participant in the capitalist system can be said to be a political radical. Well, you take what you can get in that sort of environment. A capitalist can be a political radical about as well as a whale can clean up pollution in the ocean, you know. Oh, that's cold. Hard-hitting political analysis from the Ministry of Propaganda. So Taylor Leone arrives at the White House press conference and the henchman of the Freeman regime seats her front and center, much to the surprise of her senior MSNBC colleagues. She's been given a big break in her career, but what does it matter? Human civilization is about to be destroyed by a comet. Then President Freeman reveals to the journalists that the Americans have just told the world's other leaders about the impending comet strike. You see, sir, apart from the People's Republic of F and our evil American foes, the rest of the world's nations don't have astronomers. They don't have telescopes and observatories, so they wouldn't have been able to see the comet headed for Earth. Other countries have to wait for People's Republic of F astronomers to inform them of the truth about comets, or for the diabolical and manipulative Americans to lie to them about comets and other celestial events. You can always trust the PRF Ministry of Astronomy. For hard-hitting analysis <laughs> of celestial events. President Morgan Freeman tells the naive and complicit American press corps that the comet is seven miles across the size of Manhattan, that it is larger than Mount Everest, and that in a year's time, the comet may impact the Earth. He says that the United States and Russia have secretly been building an enormous spacecraft called the Messiah. The mission of the Messiah is to intercept the comet 
and to divert it away from impacting the earth using nuclear bombs. Then, President Morgan Freeman introduces the gullible American public to the astronauts. You can't see me, but I'm using the, the air quotes with my fingers, the astronauts, mm. that will board the Messiah to go intercept the comet. The astronauts include John Favreau and Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall is there because he was the last man to walk on the moon, so he's the one with experience actually landing a spacecraft out there in space. So, Robert Duvall had an impressive second career after being one of the Apollo astronauts. He then went to law school and served as the legal muscle for the Corleone crime family, apparently, but now he's back as an astronaut. Michael Corleone told us that Robert Duvall was dead by the time of The Godfather Part Three, but he's not dead. He's come out of retirement to land the Messiah spacecraft on the comet so they can destroy it. Or maybe the Corleone crime family arranged for this. Maybe this is the astronaut version of when the mafia makes you sleep with the fishes, you know, sending you into space on the impossible comet mission. President Morgan Freeman announces that the American government will seize control of the economy to prevent price-fixing and extortion. The Americans, of course, they buy it. They just go along with it. Of course. So five months later, Taylor Leone is the MSNBC anchor covering the Messiah spacecraft's mission to intercept the comet and divert its course towards the Earth. The Americans all watch live feeds of the mission on TV. Robert Duvall lands the Messiah on the comet, like he landed on the moon more than 25 years before. John Favreau and the other astronauts have to go out and dig the nukes deep into the comet, deep enough to destroy it or divert its course away from the Earth. The actor who plays the director of Mission Command for the Messiah back on Earth at Houston, you know who that is? No, who's that? It's Kurtwood Smith. The same no guy. kidding. Kurtwood Smith. The same guy who played the gangster who kills Murphy at the start of RoboCop. That's what I was going to say. Isn't that the guy who killed Murphy at the beginning of RoboCop? It is. Yes, sir. No, at kidding. least he thinks he killed him. He doesn't count on Murphy coming back to get him as RoboCop. Spoiler alert. But just like Robert Duvall, he's had an impressive second career. Back in the 80s, he was a Detroit gangster. But now, in the 90s, he's the mission commander at Houston for NASA missions. So that's a real personal renaissance. He really turned his life around. They say it's never too late. No, it's too late. What kind of imperialism porn is this? (laughs) Also, one of the other MSNBC journalists is Una Damon. Besides working for MSNBC back in those days, she was also part of the control room up in the moon on the Truman Show. I really did like that control room. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a good second job, I'd say. Yeah. So the scene when they're on the comet trying to dig the nukes into it, it looks all right, I'd say. It's it's serviceable. Special effects get the job done. You know, it's, it's not like, it's not a highlight of the movie, the space effects, I mean. It doesn't ruin it for you, though. It's pretty good for 1998 CGI, I guess. Sure. But the Messiah mission is taking too much time, and they're not getting the nukes deep enough. Time runs out for John Favreau and his mates. The sun rises where they are on the comet, which heats it back up and activates its gas jets. So John Favreau and the rest of the astronauts are in trouble. The mission ends up being a bust. John Favreau gets blasted out into space by the gas jets on the comet, and the other astronauts can't go back to rescue him. We know that he gets back to Earth somehow, though, because he's back in time to direct the first Iron Man movie ten years later, and then after that he directs The Mandalorian. He, he must have got back to Earth the same way Sandra Bullock got to the space station in Gravity. Well, by driving the bus 55 miles an hour until she got there? Or is it... No, sir, that was a Speed with Keanu Reeves? No, I don't think that was what that was. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. That was uh, Gravity with Sandra Bullock. Yeah, that's right. And Keanu Reeves, yeah. Anyway, for now, though, it looks like John Favreau is lost in space, and it's all very sad. Hmm. He's so money, and he doesn't even know it. Is that from Swingers? No, I think that's from Gravity with Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves. And Keanu Reeves Mm -hmm. and the bus. Yeah. Okay, right, right, right. right, right. I think she may have adopted a disadvantaged um, uh, African-American child also and taught him to play football. Oh, the blind side. Is that what that is? No, it's uh, it's 
Oh, it's Gravity. It's That's Gravity right. with Sandra Bullock. That's right, and Keanu Reeves. And uh, and Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock, um, they meet with George Carlin and end up traveling back in time um, uh, to get to the their San Dimas High School project. They get Napoleon. They get uh, uh, Socrates, they call him. Uh, oh, right, right, right. the kid, maybe. Um, and like Beethoven plays the yeah. rock music on the keyboards, yeah. even Gra- though he's deaf. Gravity, yeah. Sandra but with Bullock. Sandra Bullock mm-hmm. yeah. and the, the, the school bus going 55. That's right. That's right. Yeah. George Carlin. And the, he played Rufus in that film. See, at first I thought you were talking about uh, uh, Doc and Clara from the last movie we were talking about. They also went back in time. No, no, they already were back in time. But then they had to get the train going a certain speed in order to get back to the future. No, that's a different movie. We're talking about Gravity. Oh, with Sandra Bullock. Yeah, and Keanu Reeves and okay. Morgan Freeman. And, that's right. Yeah. And Taya Leone. Taya Leone and John Favreau and uh, the other guy. Robert Duvall. Who was in Robert Duvall. Yeah, Robert Duvall. That's it, yeah. right. I like that they show this space mission to be near impossible. The astronauts are no match for the wolf Biederman comet, just like the United States is no match for the unstoppable force that is the People's Republic of F and the immovable object that is its glorious leader, General Secretary F. So everyone back on Earth is watching the live feed of the failed Messiah mission. Morgan Freeman is good in this role. He makes a good president. I can see why we manipulated the American electorate to get him in office. They're waiting in the Oval Office, Morgan Freeman and all his, his, his henchmen, his corrupt cohorts. One of the military generals gets a call from NASA, I presume, that they find out that the Messiah mission has failed. They don't use any dialogue in the scene. It's all in Morgan Freeman's eyes, the, the knowledge that this one shot that they had really to stop the comet from destroying human civilization has failed. It's, it's, like all, a, it's all in his eyes, the light, the heat in his eyes. Yeah, absolutely. And as I say, I, just, I, I can see why we manipulated the American electorate and their news media, the election process, in order to get President Morgan Freeman in office. I mean, it, that was ingenious, sir. Well, I just figured if we're going to have to listen to some Yahoo talk for four years, it might as well be someone with a nice voice. So President Morgan Freeman goes on TV to tell the Americans that the Messiah mission has failed. All it was able to accomplish was to break the comet into two pieces. Now, there's one smaller comet named Biederman that's a mile and a half across, and the larger one, Wolf, that's six miles across. Both of them are still headed for Earth. Plan B is to launch the American and Russian nuclear arsenals at the comets when they're near Earth to try to knock them off course just enough to save the planet. In the meantime, though, in case Plan B doesn't work and the comets do hit, they've been preparing huge underground bunkers where a small portion of the American population will be able to live for two years following the comet strike and then start over again after the air clears. Other countries are doing the same thing to preserve their way of life. President Freeman institutes martial law, since the Americans are going to start to panic as the comet gets close. A random lottery is set up to decide which Americans will be allowed into the bunkers. The bunkers are the Earth's Noah's Ark. And, you know, respect to President Freeman for instituting martial law. I think it was a little late. I think it should be the first act of any glorious leader. And that's just why he's not so glorious. But yeah. yeah, he's a nice voice. He's impressive. Sure, he's he's statesmanlike, but glorious. And yeah. Next, we cut to four weeks before the comet strike. The setup of the film is all done, so the rest is payoff. This movie isn't like Armageddon, a terrible movie they made with the same premise, also from Six AF or nineteen ninety eight. Deep Impact is technically a disaster movie, but They only spend about three minutes at the end of a two-hour movie actually showing the comet hitting the Earth. I like this about the film. Mostly the film is a political thriller and character study, then a science fiction film, and then a depiction of how an imaginary, functional American government would uh, handle an existential crisis like this. Can you imagine how cathartic for the Americans to imagine that their government is actually functional and is there to help them? (laughs) Because in reality... It's only there to crush their spirits under the jackboot of capitalist injustice. Hmm. Anyway, all in all, Deep Impact is pretty decent sci-fi, I'd say. You know, it's typical Americans throwing nuclear bombs at problems. As I say, the rest of the movie is payoff, and it's loads of fun. 
get some beers and popcorn out, send an application over to the PRF Ministry of Social Engineering to see if they'll let your assigned romantic partner join you to watch the rest of the film. It's a date movie, even. It's time to wrap up all the character interests, and we get to see the end of the world. Elijah Wood has the most romantic plan I've seen in the movies in a long time. He proposes to Lili Sobieski, and before she answers, he tells her that marrying him is her only chance to survive. The reason this is so romantic is because it's very much like the marriage of the citizens of the PRF to you, sir, our glorious leader, General Secretary F. Much like for Lili Sobieski, you are the people's only chance to survive here in the PRF. You know, so long as we don't cross you or show ourselves to be counter-revolutionary in some way. Like my family, for example, when you had to send them to the Arctic labor camps, which they richly deserved. Oh, absolutely. And I think, uh, I think they learned something from that. I think I learned something from that, sir. I hope so. So if Lili Sobieski marries Elijah Wood, and they're in high school, by the way, they look like they're about 15, but if she marries him, she can go live in the comet bunkers with him. And he thinks he can use his fame to get her family into the bunkers, too. So she marries him, but then it turns out he can't get her family into the Ark after all. And then, just before he's about to go into the bunkers, into Noah's Ark with his parents, he turns back and goes to rescue Lili. He goes back to Richmond, Virginia, gets a dirt bike, and he finds her in traffic. Now, this is a little implausible. What's happening is everyone who lives on the East Coast is trying to flee the East Coast, and there's just impossible traffic jam. Traffic isn't moving. But it's basically every single person who lives on the East Coast trying to get away from it. And the idea is, what we're expected to believe is, that Elijah Wood is going to be able to find Lili Sobieski in, in all this traffic. You know, if the trains would run on time, you wouldn't need all this stupid traffic. I mean, come on, America. Good grief. Also, the people in the traffic jam uh, leaving the East Coast, like, they don't seem all that urgent about it. Like, you, you see them, like, you, you see some, you know, shots of them in the film. They don't really look that concerned about the end of the world. They're just like, uh-oh, looks like the traffic's going to be a little tight. Looks like we might not get out of traffic here before the end of the world. Oh, well, you know, you can't worry about these things, though. Just get the AC going, put a little Frank Zappa on. Typical capitalist actors. They can't even play the part. It's just in it for the money, not for the revolutionary ideology. I really don't see how Elijah Wood gets Lili Sobieski to higher ground since Morgan Freeman said that the tidal wave would wash hundreds of miles inland. But whatever. He gets Lili out of the way of the wave on his dirt bike, and they're okay. Also, Elijah Wood is, is riding Lili Sobieski up into the Appalachians, I guess, on the dirt bike. Clearly, someone would have killed Elijah and Lili and taken the bike from them, since this is America and all. Since in America, they don't have from each according to his dirt bikes, to each according to his need. The last character arc they wrap up is Taya Leone's. Taya Leone's mother, Vanessa Redgrave, is not eligible for the lottery to get a spot in the bunkers in Noah's Ark because she's over 50. No one over 50 will be selected to be part of these underground bunkers in Missouri. So she gets her affairs in order and then ends it all after a nice meal with some wine and pills. Taylioni is furious with her father over this because her mother died alone. So Taylioni and Maximilian Schnell part bitterly. But in the end, instead of taking her place in the bunkers to survive the impact, she goes back and finds Maximilian Schnell on the beach, and they reconcile just in time to get drowned by the mile-high tidal wave that washes over the East Coast. They reconcile with maximum speed. This is a good metaphor for the citizens of the People's Republic of F as well. Ta Leone turns her back on the false promise of safety in the underground bunkers, and goes back to be there with Maximilian Schnell. She rejects the false promise of safety in the American bunkers, and she instead joins her glorious leader, her father. Oh, whoa. That's easy. Let's call him something else. It, There's she really goes, only one glorious leader. I, I think that you know this. It, she, okay. I don't want to give him... You're right. He doesn't deserve anywhere near that much credit. She goes right. back to be with her father to face the mile-high tidal wave with him. 
Remember, citizens of the People's Republic of F, it is an honor to be either alive or dead upon the road to revolution. Don't be seduced by the hollow American promise of safety and prosperity. Don't let the tidal wave of imperialist American military force convince you to leave the side of your glorious leader, for General Secretary F. alone is capable of surmounting the existential threat they pose. Only General Secretary F. can usher us to the sanctuary of utopia. You forgot to mention my handsomeness. The movie has to have a Hollywood ending, though. It's not like if this were a French movie or if it was atrocitarian realism like we have in the PRF. It lets us off the hook about the end of the world and has Robert Duvall and the rest of the astronauts figure out a way to destroy the larger comet. So they have four nukes left in their spaceship, and they, I don't know, run the math, and they figure out they can fly their spaceship straight at the comet, set off the nukes just in time, blow it up right before, essentially, it enters the Earth's atmosphere. Hmm. All right, so in baseball, you know, a, a fast ball... In American baseball, the pitch, you know, it's traveling at like 100 miles an hour. And in the whole world, there are maybe 20 guys who can hit a fastball like three times out of 10. Sure. Myself included. Of course, sir. Yes, sir. So if a fastball is traveling 100 miles an hour, I'm going to guess a comet, I don't know, 200 miles an hour? Two or, yeah, 250 maybe. Yeah, I mean, there's no way this is going to work. There's no way they're going to time it exactly right. They're going to set off their nukes a microsecond too soon and have no effect on the comet, or they're going to be just at the point where they think they need to detonate the bombs, but then they're going to slam into the comet before they can press the button or before the electrical signal can get to the nukes. No way this could work. Anyway, though, implausible as the whole scenario is, it turns out it's not the hotshot kids who are responsible for stopping the comet. It's the older, experienced astronaut in Robert Duvall. The last shot of the film is the rebuilding of the Capitol building in D.C. So, this movie is ultimately a tragedy. They had a real shot at getting rid of America when the comet hit. But what do they do once fate had finally destroyed the U.S.? They just start rebuilding it. Some people never learn. Like dogs returning to their vomit. But that, of course, sir, is where we, the People's Republic of F, still have our task ahead of us. All right. So, what's really going on in this movie? Don't be deceived, citizens of the People's Republic of F. There's no comet heading for Earth. This whole ploy is what's known as a false flag operation. This is the sort of stunt the Americans pull to distract everyone while they're actually trying to conquer the People's Republic of F. No one's going to notice the massive army they've sent to invade our nation while they're all busy watching these fake news stories about the comet and trying to get into the bunkers, the Ark. Now, of course, some people will say, but wait, everyone could see the comets getting larger and larger in the sky. You could even see the comets in the sky during the daytime once they were getting close. You're right, as though that's not something the Americans could fake. There's computers. I mean, come on, have you ever heard of computers? Ever heard of computers? The grief. Come on, people. Right, you've got to be smarter than that, Americans. All you have to do is take a young government agent, Elijah Wood in this case, and plant him in an American high school. You make him understand the consequences for his family and friends if he doesn't play along, and you use him to manufacture the whole story about the comet. You get that astronomer in Arizona to fake his own death in the mysteriously exploding jeep. You sell the news media on your bogus story. You get the population scared. You get them distracted. You tell them that all that massive government spending is to protect them from the comet, and they're not even going to notice all the money you spend to launch an American army against the peace-loving, noble citizens of the People's Republic of F. You get President Morgan Freeman to lead the whole operation. Everyone likes Morgan Freeman. Just listen to how beautifully he delivers his oratory. That gorgeous baritone, those speeches of his must be true. And having unveiled the American false flag operation, we see that the Americans are attempting to bully us in such a way that we have no choice but to deal with them, and to deal with them decisively. We must put them down swiftly and harshly. Not only must we maintain a powerful army, we must also organize contingents of the people's militia on a vast scale. This will prevent the American imperialists from moving a single inch on our soil when they attempt to invade. And we'll be ready to stop them when they cross our borders. 
The Americans can't fool us with their false flag nonsense. And if there ever really were a comet strike, rest assured, people of the PRF, your glorious leader, General Secretary F, would be safe, deep underground in his bunker, so that after the air cleared and the dust settled, he would emerge again to lead the world, for he is the gardener of human happiness, the sole architect of the revolution. And of course, sir, once we emerged into the post-apocalyptic wasteland to prosecute the revolution once again, you'll be needing some effective propaganda. You'll be needing some agit prop, some ballyhoo. So perhaps you'll consider allowing a room in the bunker for me and my brainwashing skills. Yeah, sure, I'll consider it. I'll let you know. Don't count on it. This has been The Art of Cinema with our glorious leader, General Secretary F. Let us maintain vigilance against the ever-looming threat of an American invasion. You are required to report any non-participation or dissent amongst your comrades. Don't forget to join us on The Art of Cinema again next time for further discussion of films from the 1990s in your next mandatory re-education session. <laughs>